Hi, Casper here, and welcome to today's wine tasting. Got a couple of really interesting wines for us to taste, and we're going to get on to the meat of the matter, which is that tasting uh, in a little bit. Uh, first of all, I'm going to tell you what I'm doing here. Who am I, and why am I talking about these wines? What are these wines? What is wine? We're going to cover a lot of topics, a little bit about the history of wine. So let's get on with it. While I'm talking, by the way, please open the white wine. Have a swirl, have a sniff, have a have a taste of it. We've been doing some other tastings where we where we send out um, six small samples, I mean just five CL samples. And it's a bit difficult to tell people to start tasting before we actually get onto the tasting bit because of course they'll have finished all their samples by the time we get there. But here, I've got two whole bottles, so please make a dent in the white one. If you could just think about as you're sniffing it, as you're sipping it. Think about what you're tasting. Does it remind you of something else? Does it uh, make you think of a certain kind of fruit or anything? A, a memory that you that you can associate with what you're smelling? Anything at all? Just try and come up with some feeling in your head about, about the wine. Who am I? What am I doing here? Why am I talking to you about these wines? Well, my name's Casper Bose and my wife and I, Victoria, um, and I have had our own business uh, since, gosh, May 19, 2002, we, we started. And um, our original business, and, and still really our, our core business, is called Bose Wine. And that really is a service where we help people to start and grow sellers of, of really nice wine for, for future drinking. We do a little bit of investment advice, uh, um, in fact more and more investment advice of course at the moment there's very little uh, to invest your money in. Wine is sort of quite an interesting thing, most of the people we find that want to invest in wine have lots of other investment property and stocks and shares and all sorts of other things and now they just want to invest in something that interests them so, so wine Investment in wine is driven by an initial interest. Of course, they want to make money out of it in the long run. And um, but actually, if the wine don't make you any money, you can get rather good revenge with uh, with one of the sticking sticking one of those in the in the in their head and sucking all their insides out. But um, uh, and yeah, what a CGT uh, free, no capital gain tax on wine, which is another attraction. Anyway, much more relevant for what we are talking about here today. These wines specifically is a educational wine sampling club that we've been running for gosh i would say the last 13 or 14 years it is called the the daily drinker and the daily drinker is the answer to my question how do you get people to drink wines that they don't want to or how do you get people to try wines perhaps they've never heard of hadn't in their wildest imaginations thought existed uh, in the first place? Well, the answer, of course, is to get people to, to join a, an annual club, pay an annual subscription. And once we've got the annual subscription, we can send what on earth we like to them. And so we send on a regular basis to our members' houses um, bottles of monovarietal wine, a real mix of stuff. Monovarietal wines, what are they? Well, monovarietal wines are wines made from just a single grape variety. And there is re reason that we want to try and stick to monovarietal wines. Um, I think monovarietal wines, you know, they're e the information about uh, such wines is easier to assimilate rather than if they're just um, branded blends. So, uh, I mean, uh, today we are tasting uh, blends, having said all this. Um, but I think from a from a really unusual country and, and uh, introducing people to to new experiences is really what we're trying to do with the daily drinker. Um, you know, I, I think uh, people have no idea of the range and the color and the diversity in in Planet Wine, and it's it's. Uh, you know our way of introducing people and of course these wines are drunk on our members sort of dining tables with their friends with their family which is of course where wines have the most chance of being sympathetically received and so yeah we are just trying to expand people's experience of wine and and therefore really their confidence in what they know about wine how to come to a better understanding of wine and it's something that I'm asked uh, really quite frequently you know how do I how do I get to find out more about wine I mean int I'm interested in wine 
but I want to feel more knowledgeable. I want to feel closer to the subject. I often feel like, you know, people who ask me this question, what they really want me to say is, is here's a list of books, go away, read those, you know, have them on your bedside table, read through them all and at the end of it, you know, rather like Neo in, in um, uh, The Matrix, you know, when I know Kung Fu, they'll suddenly go, I know wine, and there'll be this fantastic moment of enlightenment and they'll, and they'll feel like they know it all. And, I, you know, I, of course you can read books and, and gain more information, but actually coming to an understanding of wine and a feeling for wine um, uh, is really all of, just all about thinking about what you're, what you're drinking. You know, in, in so many situations where wine is drunk, uh, there is that tendency to really rather ignore what's in the glass and get on with what you're doing, be that cooking a meal in the kitchen, be that talking to people at weddings, parties, bar mitzvahs, whatever, be that just watching TV at home, watching the rugby or, or what have you. You tend to focus on, on anything but the wine and then the bottle's gone and of course there is no real memory of, of uh, what it was, what it tasted like, uh, perhaps a little memory by way of a headache the next morning of its effects. but. So what I say to people is the first step in coming closer to wine is, is, is just thinking about re what you are drinking. You know, when you are given a glass of wine, when you pour yourself a glass of wine, just for a, it need only be a split second or a couple of seconds, just stop and have a quick think about, about what you're drinking. And I am going to start, we're going to start the tasting now, and I'm just going to start by showing you how we in the wine trade taste wine. And, you know, it's something we do very quickly, and I'm going to just slow it all down so we can, you could follow the steps very closely. Um, but as I say, you know, when you become familiarised with this practice, it's something that really need only take, you know, a second or two. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to get a white piece of paper, or if you're lucky enough to have a, a white cat or West Highland Terrier sitting on your lap, that will do more than adequately. Uh, we want to take that white piece of paper and hold it behind our glass, and we're going to look through the wine, and we're going to check for clarity, and we're going to check for colour, and depth of colour as well. And what are we looking for? Well, as we go through the tasting process, looking at the wine then we're going to smell the wine and then we're going to finally taste the wine the first thing we want to say to ourselves is is there a problem here is there something about this wine that makes me feel like i don't really want to go on and, and swallow it and put it in my put it in my mouth so what we are looking for is clarity first of all you know is there a haze are there bits floating in it you know of course mature red wine you do will get a uh, often get a sediment in the bottle we call it lees or, or as I say, sediment, um, and you can you can get rid of it by pour carefully decanting the wine, pouring the whole bottle off the lees once they've been allowed to settle by standing the bottle up, um, uh, and that's completely natural. You know, certain particles in red wine they're like raindrops in a cloud. They have they're electrically charged, and over time they will clump together, and as soon as they get heavy enough, like raindrops in a cloud, they will fall out. Um, that's what sediment, and I'm talking about other things here. I'm talking about muddy looking clouds, which could be could be a protein issue, and just general a general state of disrepair, if you like. And this wine I'm looking at, it's got a, got a lovely bright sort of pale lemon colour with a little green tinge to it. And it's clear as a bell. So all the things I am looking at here suggest to me that this is a wine in a state of health. I can see no problems. Colour, the depth of colour is an interesting one as well. You know, white wine will take on colour as it ages in bottle. The older it is, generally the darker it will be. Um, and the other thing that will give a wine colour is ageing in oak barrels. So if a white wine is put into an oak barrel, it will take on some colour from, from the wood. And we know that, you know, you know with, with whiskey, whiskey goes into a barrel, um, uh, seafood really after distillation and it will pick up color as long as it's not caro a lot of the cheap whiskies are, uh, they add caramel to to give color um, uh, but if they're allowed to age naturally that color comes from the wood same with brandy so 
we're looking at a pale wine here and uh, so you know we can probably say about this wine a couple of things a it's healthy it doesn't look like there's an issue and b it's almost certainly a, a young wine and c we can probably say with some authority that it's seed no oak barrel so look we haven't smelt this wine. We haven't even tasted this wine. Well, I hope you have, because I suggested you get on with it as I was talking earlier. But, but you know, without even smelling or tasting it, we already start to build up a little store of information about this wine. We start to understand it, start to, to start to get into this wine and, and feel we know something about it. Now, the one thing, of course, that you won't be able to tell from looking at the wine, you know, it might look perfectly healthy, um, is that the wine might be corked. Now, I'm sure a lot of you will have heard this expression, cork. It's got nothing to do with bits of cork floating in the wine, and it's the classic scene in the restaurant where the wine waiter pours the wine, there's a couple of bits of cork, little bits of cork floating in the wine, and it's sent back because the, uh, the customer thinks it's, it's corked. Nothing to do with bits of cork floating in the wine. Not very appealing to have bits of cork floating in your wine, admittedly, but it's not going to give the end drinking experience any any problems. The, the, the problem with a corked wine exists in the forests over in, in um, Spain and Portugal where they grow the cork oak tree. Uh, you get a, a fungus that lives in the cork, um, in the bark of the cork oak trees. And of course that, that bark is then harvested, it's turned into corks. And the last thing that's done before that cork goes into the bottle uh, is that it's put in a chlorine bath to sterilize it. Now chlorine reacts with this this fungal element in the bark uh, to form a, a, um, a, a, a compound we in the wine trade called TCA. The reason we call it TCA is because the full name is 246 trichloranethyl so you can see why we shorten it to tca it is it is completely random um you just don't 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 really know until you until you sniff and taste the wine whether there is a problem they reckon something between three and six percent of wines with corks in are spoiled because of that cork um and it's 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 a, a great shame when it happened i opened a bottle of red burgundy just last night 2006 premier Cru. Uh, red burgundy um, and it was just unbelievably corked and the character of a cork wine is it's people describe it as musty but if you imagine leaving a piece of wet cardboard under your garden shed for six months to get a little bit moldy it's got that kind of smell a really sort of moldy cardboard sort of smell um, that can exist from in varying degrees can be very mild and actually the wine can just about be drinkable or it can be very heavy as mine was last night and, and alas the wine went down the sink and it's as i say it's it's random what is for sure is that um bet in better corks there is uh, there are a few instances fewer instances of taint and you know a good cork in can cost a european winery one euro um so, uh, but a euro worth spending, you know, if it means that fewer of your bottles are ruined, because of course, you know, bad for your, bad for your reputation if a lot of your, a lot of your bottles of wine uh, have this problem. So we feel we know quite a lot about it. So what I'm then going to do is that I'm going to swirl the wine in the glass. If you're struggling to do it, you might like to put it on the table and swirl it. Uh, like that instead on the table why are we doing what's the point of doing that well so much of what a wine is about um is about the the aroma the smell it's about volatile compounds called esters in the wine um that uh, give the wine both flavor and aroma so by doing that i'm increasing the surface area of the wine and i'm increasing the volatility of those esters and i'm making them come off the wine this is broadly speaking the shape of wine glass you're looking for one that tapers in towards the top and the reason for that is because we are making every effort to make this wine smell as much as possible and we want that smell to stay in there we don't want it wafting off across the room so when i say we're going to smell the wine we're not going to wave it around under our nose down here we're going to get our nose right in there into the glass where all the smelly stuff is going on so let's give that a go again as with looking at the wine and as we will do when we taste it 
we are at first question is there a problem here is there something that smells wrong that off smells in there and I would happily say absolutely not you know it smells completely clean I'm getting a faint nutty spiciness to it and I'm getting orchard fruit I'm getting a russet apple sort of russet apple aroma this is not an aromatic wine I have to say it's not like Sauvignon Blanc where you know you can smell it halfway across the room or Gewürztraminer you know, with that extraordinary exotic sort of lychee rose petal scent it's not really shouting about itself but it's got nice clean aromas like a summer orchard with that little bit of spice sprinkled on top it smells very nice now we're going to taste it I'm going to use this thing this is a spittoon wine tasting is about the only place that it's polite to spit um, it is uh, what time is it 20 to 4 in the afternoon at the moment I'm recording this um, even for a battle scarred old wine merchant 20 to 4 is in the afternoon is a little bit early to be um, swallowing wine I don't think there's any great alcoholic but now you see this is just 11 and a half percent alcohol very unusual really to find a wine of that uh, of that lightness in in alcohol um, these days part of the reason of course for that is is global warming you know the temperatures are rising the grapes are being harvested uh, riper with more sugar in them and the ABV the alcoholic strength in the finished wine is really dependent on how much sugar is in the grapes in the first place um, so 11 and a half percent is really really on the very much on the low side so you could have a couple of glasses of, of this at lunchtime and still move around in the in the afternoon by the way this is a blend um, this is a blend okay let, let's just let's just talk about the origin of this wine anyway we are in the Republic of North Macedonia we are in a place called Tikves and the Tikves winery and we're in the Varda River Valley which is responsible for 35 percent or thereabouts of the production of, of the Republic of North Macedonia no biggie you think you know did you perhaps you didn't even know wine was produced in the Republic of North Macedonia well you know in the big sort of crescent across from here Greece and on into into um, Armenia and Georgia and, and places like that you know this is this, this is the origins of wine this is really where wine first started and um, and for for varying reasons be they sort of the the Ottoman Empire or uh, com communist uh, expropriation you know there have been been dips in the development of wine and um, but what's happening now is we're finding all these countries are coming back Romania which has got a very very long very long uh, wine producing history uh, is coming back Bulgaria Hungary the, all these countries are coming back and how, how old is winemaking for how long has wine been made in the world well archaeologists were on a dig uh, five or six seven years ago in Armenia and they found a site which was they could demonstrate was a wine making facility and they dated that to 8,000 years ago so um, so wine making you know our, our horizons are being pushed back all the time I remember when I joined the wine trade 30 years ago people were talking about wine making as maybe two and a half thousand years old maybe a little bit more so now we're looking at eight thousand years and I wouldn't be at all surprised if if wine making history goes back a, a, a lot further than that and what the reason I wouldn't be surprised is that unlike beer and, and many other beverages um, wine is is essentially a completely natural um, natural product you know um, a ripe a ripe grape left to its own devices will ferment into wine um, it, a, a, a grape as a fruit is just a little factory um, uh, and full of chemical reactions that happen all the time even long after you pick it that bunch of grapes in your fruit bowl in the kitchen at the moment is a living thing you know there there are chemical reactions happening in it all the time and um, on the skins of the grapes you'll find Saccharomyces yeast which is the 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 wine yeast and inside the grape this lovely sugary juice on which the Saccharomyces yeast will will feed and it will 
produce a carbon dioxide and it will produce wine. And, you know, looking back 8,000 years, of course, we're talking about a pre-scientific time in the world, pre-scientific cultures for whom there are, the world in, around them is, is really very, very mysterious. They really have very few explanations for what, what goes on in the world. And, um, you know, fermentation of, of grapes must have been the most extraordinary, one of the most extraordinary mysteries of all, you know, that a, a bucket of, wine, of grapes left in the corner in a warm place after three, four days will start to sort of smoke and bubble and writhe about. Um, and then, you know, some time after that, you'll be left with this extraordinary liquid, which smells completely different, um, which draws draws you to it. And on drinking it, you know, you suddenly get this urge to invite your neighbours around and give them some food and tell a few jokes. Um, There's a fascinating programme, actually, on Radio 4 uh, the other day. Uh, it was a, part of a series about, about yeast presented by a young, um, young uh, scientist. And he was explaining his hypothesis of why human beings are drawn to wine, about why we like wine, the smell of wine, why we like drinking wine. And he, his, he suggested that it was really based from a time long before uh, Homo, Homo sapiens even existed, you know, when we were still sort of primates just come down from the trees. You know, then the smell of wine, the smell of fermenting fruit, was a sign of, of the riches of autumn, really. Um, it was a time when you wanted to pile on a few pounds because winter was coming and, and you know, probably a quite a lean period in terms of finding food. And the smell of wine, the smell of fermenting fruit, was really a sign of there being ripe fruit to eat. So we could smell it across the forest, make our way to it and strip the tree and, and eat all we wanted. So. So I thought it was fascinating anyway, this, this idea that our love of wine might go back to a pre-human, uh, it's so innate, you know, it existed in us uh, when we were sort of little hairy creatures. Um, anyway, this wine, so um, yes, th this wine, a blend of a couple of local grapes, Smederevka, Ricazzatelli, and, and then a real international Chardonnay, which I'm sure you've heard of. Both Smederevka and Rakatsatelli we have uh, done as monovarietals for the daily drinker and both capable of producing uh, really exciting wines. And, and, you know, this is part of the excitement at the, at the moment, you know, that after 8,000 or more years of global wine production, we are living now at the most exciting time in its, its production. You know, there is more diversity there and more better made wines available from a greater diversity of, of, of countries and a, a huge range of these exciting grape varieties. I mean, one of our Bibles here in the office is a book written by Jancis Robinson and, and a couple of her friends, and it's called Wine Grapes, but it, it profiles 1,368 grapes that are in, currently in commercial production in the world. And I think, you know, you can blow people's minds with that because I think most people would probably say that maybe there are 20 or 30 grapes in commercial production you know the ones we've all heard of Merlot Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Noir, Shiraz, Cabernet Sauvignon and a few others but 1,368 and most if not all of them if treated right grown properly made in the right way are capable of producing a wine that's extremely drinkable and um, you know technology now has leapt on even in the past 10 years in winemaking and I think there is very little bad wine about so really exciting to try these wines and we're trying to give part of that excitement away as with daily drinking membership you know and I'm hoping when daily drinkers get their box through the post they open the front door there's posty standing there taking this box open it up pull out a bottle and look at it and go oh no what's Casper sent us you know I mean we sent, recently sent out wines from Georgia and, you know, I'm hoping people look at them and go, oh, wine from Georgia, surely he can't have sent us that. And then, as I say, you know, get opened at the table, get drunk with friends and family with a bit of food in a relaxed setting. And, and um, suddenly, you know, the light bulb comes on, you know, a moment of Satori where you go, 
gradually Georgian wine actually can be quite good. And what's this great variety? I mean, here's, a, here's another wine from the Tickfest Winery made from just a single red grape variety, Cratachar. So then you go, God, Cratachar, whatever it is, can make some really, really nice wine. So what about educating people, really? Well, there's the, the, the white. Mm. Tasting it, you can you can hear me making a bit of a stupid noise when I'm when I taste the wine. And again, I'm saying to myself straight away, is there is there a problem? It's in my mouth, but should I actually spit it out or can I swallow it? Well, I could have swallowed it. You know that you can tell there's not a not a problem with it. The weird sucking noise I'm making um, sounds ridiculous. I realise, but. The reason I do it is very much the same reason I swirl the wine in the glass. You know, what I'm trying to do is expose the wine in my mouth to more air to get those aromatic compounds coming off. Because, you know, the truth is what you taste in your mouth in terms of both food and wine or whatever, um, most of the tasting is done with your nose. When you have a mouthful of food, you are chewing it. The food is giving off volatile, uh, volatile, um, uh, aromatic compounds that go up into your nose. So most of what you taste in your mouth, with your mouth, is done by your nose anyway. And you'll know that's true because you, you will all, I'm sure all of you will have experienced having a terrible cold and food tastes like cardboard. You know, you actually cannot tell anything. There's nothing wrong with your mouth, but your nose is completely blocked and it ruins your sense of sense of taste. And um, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm sucking air through it, getting more of these volatile aromatic compounds coming off. So I get, so the taste experience is, is more intense. Now wine is 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 made up of hundreds of compounds and, and we don't know what all of them are. You know, this is part of the mystery of wine, part of what, what we really don't understand and part of what's so appealing about wine. This mystery continues. But really from a tasting point of view, we can break white wine down into three constituents, uh, alcohol, fruit, and acidity. And if we start with acidity, mm. acidity, if you want to know about acidity, how to identify um, levels of acidity in something, um, next time you go into the kitchen to make yourself a G&T, as you're slicing, slicing the lemon, just have a little sort of suck on it and think about what is happening in your mouth. And the part of your mouth that gets affected more than any other is under the back of your tongue. The reason for that is your salivary glands are situated there under the back of your tongue. And as soon as a wave of acidity hits them, they start tingling, they start fizzing away and chucking out masses of saliva. And actually I can feel most white wines have that you know, a, a acidic um, a component, which which will instantly be felt underneath the back of the tongue. And I can feel that affect it. And it's not the most acidic of wines, but um, it's got acidity for me, a bit like sort of biting a green apple, maybe. Um, I can really feel it there. Mm. What's the fruit of a wine? Well, the, Fruit is, is really the, the, the density, the texture. If you can imagine drinking a glass of water from the tap, what kind of texture does it have in, in, in your mouth? Well, the answer is none. It doesn't really have any texture across the tongue at all, does it? Well, the difference between water and, and this, um, think about that. And really what you're talking about is, is the fruit, fruit component largely. Alcohol. Alcohol should be invisible, and certainly in a wine at 11.5% alcohol, it will be invisible. Some bad winemakers will use alcohol to cover up some, some bad winemaking because alcohol is sweet. It has a, a sort of glycerol sort of texture um, that sweetens the wine, softens it, and high alcohol can make a bad wine seem quite acceptable. Um, Having said that, you know, there's a big debate at the moment about oh, a lot of wines are too alcoholic. Well, I remember being in the in the Southern Rhone in Chateauneuf de Pape a few years ago and I tasted a barrel of wine that was naturally 17.2% alcohol. But, you know, it was the product of a certain, a certain vintage. It was the product of a, a vineyard that was well over 100 years old. So gnarly old 
vines um, with their roots very deep in the ground, producing very few grapes that w had a lot of sugar in them. And, you know, it's the most beautiful thing. You just have to arrange somewhere soft to land when you, um, when you drink wines like that, because after two glasses, you almost certainly will topple, back, topple backwards and, and the chance of clocking your head on the coffee table is, is really quite high. Um, so you, you shouldn't, in the normal course of things, you shouldn't, alcohol shouldn't be a problem. When you do notice it, you'll notice it when you swallow the wine, you'll feel this warmth back here. Um, yeah, I was really excited about this wine. We're stocking it, you know, even though, you know, it's not a mono varietal. Um, because I think it, it does Macedonia nicely and it's got those two very, very much uh, local grapes in it. Um, it's actually got a third local grape in it, which I got really excited about uh, because besides Smederevka, Ricazzatelli and Chardonnay, it has a grape, uh, it says on the back label, it also contains a grape called Temjanica. Now, I hadn't heard of Temjanica and I got really excited because I'm a, I'm a, you know great variety nut i love to taste things that i haven't ever tasted before so i quickly went to jancis's wine books and looked it up and was very disappointed to find that it's just a local name for one of the muscat grapes actually the greatest of the muscat which is called muscat blanc à petit grain which means white muscat with small berries so temunica and yeah this is this can be a real problem it's called ampelography ampelography the study of wine grapes and um you get centres of confusion. One of them is the Iberian Peninsula, where particular grapes can have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different names. And it's really only recent recent development of DNA profiling of grape varieties that's led to um, led to proper identification. So Tempranillo is the great red grape of Rioja. Tempranillo is also known as Ul de Lieble, which means hare's eye. It's also known as Tinta Fino. It's also known as Tinta del de Tinta Tinta de Toro. It's known as Sensibel near Madrid in Portugal. It's known as Aragonés. Um, it has so many names and so many great varieties like that. And and you know they've obviously at some stage in in the past have spread around the world. And in some instances we know how they've been spread. You know we can follow their their uh, their trails and in others it's a complete mystery you know these these um yeah just things have traveled uh, obviously most often with, with with humans as they move around the world and actually most often with the with the clergy who you know use will be using um uh, wine in, uh, as part of their religious um for ceremonial purposes but i'm gonna pour myself a glass of this red wine now and we should taste that because I feel like I've been wittering on for a very, very long time. So, again, this is this is a blend, and again, it's a blend of of, of very much local grapes with with uh, a extremely well known international grapes. So this is Vranich and Merlot. Vranich, it's a superb grape. Uh, a couple of red grapes in this region that I love. Really dark coloured wines. Vranich is one. And the other is Saparavi, which is grown throughout the sort of Bal Balkans, um, Balkan uh, region. And um, uh, so let's have a look. Again, we're going to look at it. And actually, it's quite a hard thing to, to look at, even against a white background, because it's so deeply coloured. You could almost sort of fill a pen and write home to your family with it. It's... Um, you know, we did the thing with white wines, talk about how young white wines are, are generally pale in colour. Um, and you can do the same with red wines, really. Yeah, yeah, some of you will probably know that, that almost 100% of grapes grown for making wine have clear juice. Uh, there is no colour in the juice at all. So in fact, from red grapes, you can make white wine because you press the grapes and take the juice away from the skins very quickly because the, all the colour, and actually a lot of the flavour, is in the skins of the grapes. So what you do to make red wine is you press the grapes and you ferment the whole thing and you allow them to steep there with the skins and leach the colour out of the out of the skins. And um, the colour quickly in a red wine will go will will change as it as it ages. So it'll start off the colours of young wine are sort of uh, ruby, yes, but also 
telltale colours for young wine, red wine are, are pinky, purplish, bluish. And this very much has a sort of purple cast to it. I mean, again, it's clear what I can see through it, which isn't a lot, but it, it, it sort of glows with a rude health. It really does. It looks healthy in the glass. And we know that it is, is young because of that purplish tinge. But now we're going to smell any sort of problem. I don't pick up any problem here. And this actually is why I love these things. Beautiful they ain't, but a screw cap is just a, a fabulous invention. You can feel real confidence when you buy a wine with a screw cap that there will be none of the associated problems you get from, from, from uh, a cork sealed um, bottle of wine. And they're much easier to re recap and bung back in the fridge or whatever you're going to do with them. If you can't finish a bottle, God forbid. Um, and actually a little tip is, you know, if you've opened a bottle of red wine and you've drunk a couple of glasses out of it and you're perhaps going away for a day or two, best thing to do, put the cap back on it or put the cork back in it and put it in the fridge because a red wine will keep much, much longer when it's chilled. And then all you have to do when you want to start restart your relationship with the bottle is just take it out of the fridge, let it come up to uh, the temperature you think is best for, for serving at room temperature, if that's your thing. Um, so yeah, there's one tip. And I just get this lovely, pure, dark, damson kind of fruit, sort of small plums and maybe little bit of smoke and licorice and perhaps even a bit of pen ink. Um, yeah, so just adds to that feeling I could fill my fountain pen with it. Um, smells clean. There doesn't seem to be any sort of a, any sort of a problem. It smells jolly nice. I hope you agree with that because I think it smells super. The smell of fruit, you know, the, the, I say it smells of damson, is also a sign of a young wine. You know, wine, for us in the wine trade, wine goes through really through three phases, primary, secondary and tertiary. Most wine you'll drink, especially at this sort of price level, are in the secondary stages. Primary stages, really post-fermentation, whether when, when there are fermentation characteristics. But by the time it gets into bottle, it's it's really hit the secondary stage. And sec wines in the secondary um, stage will will generally smell of fruit. Um, only some wines are worth aging in bottle for any length of time. Uh, certainly not all. And very often they will, with time, develop what we call tertiary characteristics. And tertiary characteristics can be uh, you know anything but often you know not related to fruit uh, some very unusual sort of you know black rubber and cedar and you know all sorts of of third things not related to fruit so that's tertiary phase so the fact i can smell fruit and it's purple in color make me think this is a young wine by the way another tip and a mistake a lot of people make if you open a bottle of wine while you're cooking, um, fine, have the glass in the kitchen for you, to, for you to sip on as you're cooking or indeed sip a bit in the food. But try and keep the open bottle away from the food when it's cooking or put, the, put, put that cap back on it. Wine is like a sponge, you know, it will ex absorb um, aromas from the air. And when you go back to it, what you'll find is it smells of curry or bolognese sauce or pizza or whatever you happen to be cooking uh, and it yeah it won't be the same so don't keep an open bottle of wine in the kitchen when you're cooking a little bit of chocolate maybe it smells delicious I'm going to taste it now mm. This is quite an unusual pairing, actually. Usually when you find a pair of wines like this, red and white from the same winery, you'll find, if anything, that white wine is, is from a more recent vintage than the red. But actually, this white wine's from 2018, and this red is from 2019. And it's really sprightly in the mouth. What, and what I was saying about the components in the white wine, the acidity, the alcohol, the fruit, for red wine, we can add, we can add tannin. Now, if you don't know what tannin is, Crikey, what's the best thing to do? Yeah, when, when, when you've had a bite on that lemon, to, uh, when you're making your G&T to check out what acidity does to your salivary glands, 
then peel a banana and chew the banana skin and you'll soon find out what tannin is. Or, or, or get a Sharon fruit. I don't know if you know those orange fruit they sell in the supermarket. And when they're underripe, they, you, put them, you take a bite out of them and it's honestly like having a squirrel sitting on your tongue. Your whole mouth sort of furs up with this extraordinary dry sensation. And tannin is, 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 is like that, really. It's that dry sensation you get on the tongue, or particularly on the gums um, and your cheeks. Mm. And I get a bit in here, not instantly, the entry, as we call it, which is a sensation as the wine goes in the mouth, is all about the fruit. And then suddenly the tannin starts building. Tannin is a, is a, is a compound. It's, it's what we call a polyphenol. It exists in the skin of the grapes. It's an antioxidant. So actually, it's, it's very, very good for you. Some people are uh, alarmed by tannic wines. They find them too austere and shy away from them. But the fact remains that 90 plus percent of red wines are really designed for drinking with food. Um, and it's a, it's a shame for the winemaker these days that a lot of people who like a glass of red wine will expect every red wine to do a bit of everything. So be good in front of the rugby, to be good with food, to be good chatting to friends. And the fact remains that most red wines really need a bit of food with them. What you'll find with tannins is that when you put them with food, particularly the right sort of food, those tannins will just disappear, and the sensation, the tannic sensation, will will no longer um, will no longer be there. And you find it particularly with meat. Actually, I'm sorry for, for vegans or vegetarians present, but a very tannic red wine, if you put it with a fatty piece of meat like a piece of lamb, uh, you'll find those tannins just sort of melt away. Um, and as I say, they're they're a very healthy thing. Uh, tannins in in red wine they 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 keep the wine in 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 good condition they are antioxidants they're good for you um the other thing i find about this wine is it's also got lovely acidity and and um sometimes when you look at very dark red wines you expect to be very heavy in fact this in terms of alcohol is quite punchy it's 14 percent. so it's it's um wine one to treat with some circumspection but I don't find anything heavy about this wine to smell or indeed to taste. It's got real vibrant crispness. It's, it's not, as I say, it's not, not a heavy thing. It's quite light on its feet. That acidity and the tannin is really what we refer to as the structure of the wine. And I describe it as like a skeleton and the fruit is like the flesh. So if you if you compare it to a person, so without a skeleton, the wine would just be a sort of a, a blob, like a person, just a sort of blobby pile of flesh on the floor. Not very interesting. It's really the structure of the wine that gives it shape, makes it attractive. Uh, you know, when it comes to wine, I'm a real acid head. I love acidity uh, in wine. It really communicates the character of the wine. Um, it is wine, you know, wine without acidity is, is, is incredibly dull. Oh. And for the record, I, I absolutely think that's a food wine. I think it's shouting out some food. And yeah, you know, um, spag bowl, why not? Um, bit of lamb, bit of beef, you know, it'd be, it'd be very nice on the Sunday lunch table. Um, but you know, it's pretty versatile. Pasta, veggies, you know, um, I don't understand tofu, but hell, why not? You know, try, try it with, and I'm, I'm so not a Nazi when it comes to um, a subject I know that there's been a lot, there is always a lot of talk about, which is food and wine pairing. I, I think um, there are very few no-nos when it comes to wine. You know, eggs are difficult, tomatoes difficult, asparagus is difficult. Um, few other things are a bit tricky but by and large you know cook what you want to cook and then if you feel you know you want to open a bottle of something in particular do it you know just just drink the wine you want to drink uh, you know in fact in Alsace in France they, they drink um, they drink some big white wines with 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 red meat 
Um, and I have no objection at all. I, I think um, that pairing of food and wine is really overstated. I'm, I'm a free spirit when it comes to what I drink with the food I eat. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think there, can, there are very few errors. You know, if you open a bottle of wine and it doesn't particularly go with the food that you're eating, open something else. Put it on the, you know, put it on the side and and save it for an, save it for for tomorrow. You know, it's um, it's uh, yeah, it's not a not a thing I spend a lot of time thinking about. I must say, but um, anyway, you know, that's the tasting. Those are the wines. I hope that in some way I've made you maybe look at wine a little bit differently. Hopefully I've given you your first ever taste of, of North Macedonian wines, red and white, and hopefully at least one of them, either red or white, preferably both, um, have converted you. And, and uh, you know, as I say, we're living at the most exciting time in wine's history right now. Um, go and explore Greece. I mean, the Greeks are making some of the most interesting and exciting wines of Europe uh, from a huge catalogue of, of indigenous grape varieties that are grown there and really nowhere, nowhere else. It's a really exciting time. You know, if you're into wine, you really owe it to yourself to get out there and find out what happens beyond and above the shelves of the supermarkets and perhaps even your local wine merchant. You know, there's so much going on. But um, yeah, if there are, you know, when we do these tastings live, people, I encourage people to butt in and ask questions or use the chat function on, on Zoom uh, to, to put questions forward. Obviously can't do this, this is recorded, but if you have questions, I'll put my uh, email somewhere on here. Please feel free to, to, to email me and ask me any questions you might, you might have for me. I'll be delighted to answer them, but I hope you've enjoyed your today, today's tasting. I certainly in, absolutely love ranting on my favorite subject, wine, and if where possible, introducing people to new wine experiences. So it's been a good day for me all round. Hope you've enjoyed it as well. And thanks for listening. Bye.